All right, let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. So it's a pleasure to have Jeff Anderson um, as a part of our Warren Lecture. So if I want to introduce him briefly, Jeff um, mm, received uh, his master's degree from uh, UC Berkeley and then um, um, a PhD in geophysical fluid dynamics from Princeton. He did two years or a couple of years postdoc in National Center for um, Environmental Prediction and then spent the next decade of his life um, um, at NOAA Geophysical Fluid Dynamic Laboratory to develop infrastructure for weather and climate prediction. Since 2001, he is a senior. He has been a senior research scientist in National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, he's very well known for developing test bed um, and software to facilitate ensemble data assimilation to improve weather and climate prediction for years. And the software that he has developed um, has been widely used in, in atmospheric and hydrologic community. He's going to talk about it, hopefully. Um, Jeff has more than 150 peer-reviewed publication, actually. One of them, which is the favorite among hydrologists and atmospheric scientists, I was checking and it has received almost more than 1,500 citation. Uh, uh, 1,500 citation, yes, so which is remarkable in the area of data assimilation. Where six people care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he has been serving long time as the editor of Monthly Weather Review. Please join me to welcome him. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Arthur. Yeah. I'm, I'm Mike. <laughs> um, so thanks for having me. I go to lots and lots of universities each year as part of my role from the National Center of Atmospheric Research. We are funded by, to a small extent, by universities but through NSF and one of the things we are supposed to do is outreach to university communities. Some of us do more than others. And this talk is really going to be focused at the further back rows. I see all the important old people like me are in the front. Um, uh, so we're already beyond hope. But for some of you in the back, maybe there's a, some stuff that's interesting. And I really encourage you to ask questions as we're moving forward because we're just wasting everybody's time if I'm saying stuff that's not making sense. Um, so to get started, who has good hands back there? Students. No one will volunteer. Okay. So this is just going to happen now. Okay. <laughs> back to me. Very good. Okay. We just did a prediction system problem. Okay, involving data assimilation. Now I'm going to explain why that's the case. Okay. So I'm going to take that simple problem we just did. I'm going to make it even a little bit simpler here with this. So the problem I'm going to think about is a two-dimensional problem. I have a ball moving through a gravitational field. I threw it at you and you fortunately were able to catch it. So what's going on with this really simple problem? In the idealized one here, the ball has a trajectory of two seconds and lands at the spot that's shown. And so you did a problem like this. I tossed the ball. You managed to get your hands underneath it. So you did a control problem of moving your hands in response to a prediction problem. And so one of the things you needed to do that prediction problem was actually what we would call a prediction model in some of the fields I'm in. The term prediction is one of these things across fields that gets really, really confusing. People use it with different but related meanings. And here by a prediction model, I mean something that if I tell you where the ball is now, it's going to tell you where the ball is sometime in the future. And of course, that model in this idea lies problem is extremely simple. High school physics there, okay, so I'm going to get a parabola moving through the x uniformly and the y with acceleration of gravity. Okay. Now, the problem was there may have been some uncertainty for you. It's what is this crazy guy doing throwing a ball at me in the middle of this meeting? And is he an athlete? Is he as old as he looks? Okay, how's it going to work out? And so there was uncertainty about the initial conditions of the ball as it came to you. And in the idealized problem, we might represent that as that, that's me, okay, in the model. And there was uncertainty about all these factors that led to the initial trajectory of the ball, which you then needed. So, in essence, when I first threw the ball, you had a problem that looked much more like this than that single red trajectory. Okay, this is sampling some idealized notion of uncertainty of my shoulder, arm, length, velocity, everything else. And so, in this particular case, if that's all you had, your uncertainty about how this unknown guy might throw a ball, 
it was going to be really difficult from all these different possible scenarios to get your hand under the red ball in time to catch it. But you did. Okay. So how did that happen? And again, the exact analogy between how your brain does this and this simple problem is a little bit more complicated. But in fact, there's neurological reasons to believe that it happened something like this. In addition to the prediction model, you need observations or measurements. Again, this is, these are terms that get confused between different fields. You need something from an instrument. In this case, it was your eyes, but maybe it would be a stroboscopic measurement of the ball or a radar gun getting the position of the ball from the back of the room. And of course, observations have errors. So in this idealized example, I'm going to show the observations as being a red plus. They're taken every half second. And associated with them is some error distribution, which for now I've just indicated as a circle. You can think of it as a binormal distribution of uncertainty in the observation. So somehow you're going to have to combine those pieces of information, the model forecast and these observations coming in every half second in this idealized case. And the process of combining forecasts from a prediction model and observations from an observing system goes by many, many names, uh, literally dozens of names in different fields. One of the legacy developments of this is in numerical weather prediction where this started in the 1950s and there it goes by the term data assimilation. You may have heard data fusion, various inverse something or other problems, all these things. But combining the observations with the forecasts and again in geosciences, the result, which is really a posterior to statisticians, the result of combining the forecast with the observations is called an analysis in geosciences. Again, many different fields, many words and use has been limited enough in the fields of engineering that are represented in this department that I'm not sure there's actually a native terminology or not and that's something I probably want to discuss with people after the talk. Okay, so I'm going to do something extremely naive now to solve this problem initially and that is I'm going to take a whole bunch of random samples of the uncertainty in the throw, okay, things about my arm, velocity and everything else and I'm just going to run a whole bunch of trajectories. In this case I ran I believe 10,000 here and on the plot I'm showing the 50 that ended up closest to this observation location half a second in. And these ones are shaded so that the ones that are closer, so more likely to have occurred with this observation are a darker blue and the ones that are further away less likely to agree with this observation are lighter blue. And so this sample of a distribution is what I'm calling the solution to this estimation problem and this would converge to the analytical solution if I had a very, very large number of these samples of the uncertainty in the throw. Okay, so this is what I'm going to call an analysis here. Okay, and this analysis in addition to giving me an estimate of the ball's position, it also tells me uncertainty. Okay, so data assimilation in its full form is a stochastic problem. It's all about getting a PDF that tells me where the ball is. Okay. Historically, many of the methods applied have tried to give just the maximum likelihood estimate of that PDF, the best guess of where the ball is. But we will solve the problem in a more general sense here. And in many applications, data assimilation becomes a sequential process. I take my observations after half a second, my forecast there, I get this analysis, this estimate of where the ball is. And then I can use those pieces of information to make a forecast starting at time 0.5. The ball is now sailing toward you through the room. You're getting an idea of where it is and you're going to modify the position of your hand. And here is now what the forecast looks like for these 50 most likely ones. It's still spread out a lot. Okay, there's a good chance you're not going to be able to catch it with this amount of information. But it's definitely not as bad as before. There's not balls bouncing. There's not balls going through the ceiling or anything else. And the green case here, this is the probability weighted average of these estimates of where the ball might be. It is the maximum likelihood estimate of where the ball is. Sometimes called an ensemble mean. Okay, so I can repeat the sequential process. I have observations after one second. And all I'm doing here now is I'm taking of those many, many samples, not all of which are shown here, I'm now finding those that have the 
maximum likelihoods that are most in agreement with both of these observations, okay, after those first few seconds. And again, the shading tells me some that are more likely, some that are less. I can make a forecast after one second, and now my estimate of the ball has less uncertainty, and the ensemble mean is what it is. I can repeat it one more time at one and a half seconds. You can now see that we're getting quite close to the red trajectory here for the high probability dark blue one. And this is the forecast after half a second. And now you probably have a good chance of getting your hands underneath the ball. Okay. So this is a general methodology for doing this type of data assimilation problems. I will review quickly those slides I just went through. So basically as we move through this process of estimating the trajectory, as we get subsequent observations in and make forecasts, we will find that there is less uncertainty and normally, not guaranteed, the ensemble mean will get closer and closer to the real thing. It's still a stochastic problem, so you could get unlucky with bad observations. So again, just to summarize, after half a second worth of observations, one second, one and a half seconds. So you can see our uncertainty going away and our estimate getting closer to the actual trajectory. In addition, we can do lots and lots of other things with this data assimilation procedure besides just making a forecast of where the ball's going to be. Uh, one very common use that I think has lots of implications for the type of work that goes on in some of departments I think are represented here is a notion of what's called a reanalysis in atmospheric science. It can also be referred to as a smoother. This involves using the observations not only up to the time at which you're making the forecast, but also using observations in the future to improve your estimate of where the ball was. So for instance, if I really am very interested in where the ball was after half a second, as I use the observations in the future, this is what I know about it after observations at half a second. If I add in the observations after a second, you can see my estimate of the state at half a second getting more and more less and less uncertain, and in this case, more and more accurate. Okay, so that would be a smoother or reanalysis estimate. And in addition, in the short time we have today, I can't go through the mechanism for all these other things, but data assimilation allows you to do all kinds of stuff. The first two we've talked about, estimates of where the ball is now and where it's going to be, and estimates of where the ball was, that's the first two bullets. We could estimate model parameters. So I could use data assimilation to estimate the value of G, that was the only parameter, again, a dangerous term. Parameter means a lot of different things to different fields. But here, something that is not normally predicted in the model, G, could still be estimated by looking at the trajectory the ball has. So if I landed you on some mystery planet, allowed you to stroboscopically observe the ball flying through the air, you could get a probabilistic estimate of gravity on that planet. You can go back and estimate things about the initial conditions. How long is my arm? What was the velocity of my arm as the ball was being thrown? And then you can start doing things that were not immediately obvious in that sample problem. You could estimate errors with the observing system itself. I just specified how bad the observations were, and so that was a given. But if I didn't know how the observing system, say a radar at the back or a stroboscopic light, if I didn't know the errors associated with those, I could estimate them. I could design new observing systems. Maybe I do want to put a radar gun in, in the back of the room. Okay, what would I need for its error characteristics to get a certain level of error in a trajectory? External forcing, let's suppose there were a strong wind blowing through the room, and it is a little bit cold still, but a strong wind blowing through the room. I could estimate from the deviation of the ball from the trajectory I expected from its model something about that external forcing. It's not in my model, but it's something I empirically know is influencing things. And this is really, really important because basically every type of model that you end up working with has some features that are not incorporated in the model itself that are still important. And in fact, the power and danger of the methods I'm describing is that you can in fact estimate anything that you can correlate with that set of trajectories that you're predicting. Okay? So that means you can estimate all kinds of great stuff. It also means you can find any number of meaningless correlations that appear to be, you know, by chance meaningful and publish your favorite paper on those relationships. So a powerful tool that has to be used with care. So, so far, no questions. Are there any questions on the general idea of what we're doing so far? So students in particular, I really encourage you to, to jump in with questions if things aren't making sense, if you're just curious, whatever else. It's hard to get those things rolling. Yeah, do it. Um, 
Yes, I can, and I'm going to postpone answering that to a little bit later in the talk. And so when I get to the next set of animations in around 25 minutes, would you remind me to address that question? It'll be easier at that point, but it's a great question. Anything else for now? Okay. So, so far I've done this apparently two-dimensional problem, okay? Not really relevant to the models that most of us use. For instance, in numerical weather prediction, models now have on order of 100 million gridded values of temperature, winds, and other things in the atmosphere. So way more than two. But in fact, we really did a four-dimensional problem here already because there were two sort of hidden variables. The u and v velocity components were part of the model. And we were really estimating them too. I could have looked at estimates of them. But in fact, it turns out that the method I've described so far is entirely general for any prediction model, no matter how large. And of course, my specialty is in these geophysical models, but name a hydrological model, anything else. If we think of the model as having a state represented as a vector, and so many of the models of geophysical sciences and some of the hydrological models and other things you work with have a notion of a gridded set of variables that define what's going on in the problem. If you just unroll those into a big long vector, you can think of the time change of the model, the prediction, as just being a point moving through a phase space. Every of uh, students, if you don't understand that phase space word, raise your hand now. Don't be shy. Everyone get it? Okay. Basically, I'm going to define a high dimensional space. And let's think for a moment of just a model of the temperature in this room. It might have um, 20 grid points along each row of the seats, and it might have four or five levels of those. So maybe five. 500 values of temperature that the model is representing in this room. Think of a set of coordinate axes. Each axis represents the value of one of those values of temperature. So this axis represents the temperature at this point in the room. This axis represents the point temperature at that point in the room. And now this is going to be a very high dimensional space, maybe 500 dimensional. But I can still think of having a coordinate value in that 500 dimensional space that represents the temperature in this room. And as the temperature values in the room change, that coordinate value will move through that 500 dimensional space. All the methods I've described here so far and the methods I will continue to describe have no implicit or explicit assumptions about the number of dimensions representing where this ball is. And so any of these problems are completely analogous to this two-dimensional problem, just in many, many higher dimensions. And so the problem becomes how can we come up with efficient methods to solve these things in high dimensions? Okay, I'm a visual thinker. I know that some people in engineering departments are think with equations. I'm briefly going to show some equations. Those of you who don't think with equations or who don't want to think hard this morning, you can ignore these and we'll get to a visual interpretation of what they mean in a minute. But the general problem I'm trying to solve here is the following. Equation one is my prediction model and x is this vector that represents the state. So it's the vector of the x, y, and velocity components of the ball, or it's the vector of the 500 temperatures in the room. And I have a model on the right-hand side which has a deterministic part, which is f, and a stochastic part, which is g. But basically, equation one just tells me if I know x at one time, I am able to find the time tendency and then numerically compute the value of x at another time, forecast model. I have observations y, a vector, so possibly more than one observation at a given time. And those observations y are related to my state vector x by a function h, possibly nonlinear, possibly very complex. And in addition, there is some noise associated with the observations. So the observations, like the ones we were doing, have some uncertainty associated with them. Okay. Uh, and we'll make some assumptions on that noise, basically that it's white in time and uh, Gaussian. These assumptions can be relaxed, but for the quick overview we're doing today, we're going to keep it like that. I'm going to define now a set, capital Y, of time tau. Capital Y is all the observations taken up to and including the time tau. So if I started observing the position of the ball at time 0 0.5, tau at 1.5 would include the observations at 0 0.5, 1, and 1.5. If I were doing weather prediction, I might have started observing the atmosphere a week ago and all the observations I've taken during the last week up until this morning are included in Y for tau this morning. 
And formally, I'm going to define a probability distribution that I want to get here for my analysis, my estimate of the state now. It's the probability of my state vector x given all the observations up to and including now. For a forecast, it's my probability of my state vector x given all the observations up to and including now, but at a time later than now. And I could write probability distributions for all the other things I said we could estimate too, but I won't here. Remember, interrupt with questions at any point if you have them. Okay, and we will quickly go through this slide in the limited time today, but those of you familiar with estimation theory what should see things that you're familiar with. Those of you who aren't familiar, basically what we're going to do for that step where we combine the observations in the model, so prediction model and observations, is we're simply going to use high school statistics. This is a slightly more complex form of Bayes rule than you would have learned in a high school um, class on probability. And basically, in a moment, we'll say what this means. For those of you, again, familiar with the theory, this is where we're going to use that white and time thing, which is a very important part of this theory and hard to overcome so that the observation errors between one time and another are not correlated. That allows us to simplify this term in the numerator of Bayes. And the denominator of Bayes is simply a normalization because I need to get a probability distribution out here. So it's just making sure that the area under that numerator is 1. Okay, so now this is the final simplified equation that we have. This term here, probability of x at now, p sub k, given all observations at previous times, that's our forecast from the last time we had observations. If I were doing the ball, this would be the forecast valid at time one and a half seconds, given all the observations up to one second, for instance. This is something called the likelihood in Bayes. It's the probability that I would have observed what I did observe, the red cross, if the value of x had a particular value. Okay, that was how dark the probability is associated with a particular observation. The numerator, uh, the denominator, I don't care about. It's a normalization. And this thing is my posterior analysis. It's the probability of x given all the observations now up to the present time. Okay, so back to graphical thinkers in a minute. The method I've described so far, which was just sample a whole bunch of the uncertainty of my throwing and see what the probability was compared to these observations, was a completely naive method called a naive particle filter. It turns out that that's absurdly expensive even for the two-dimensional problem. Um, there are ways to make particle filters much, much smarter that work for moderate size problems, not for the type of problems I normally work on. But those particle filters scale very poorly as the problem gets larger. And so I will not consider them further today. That does not mean that particle filters are not relevant to some research problems that people here may be looking at. They just won't work on 100 million variable problems that I am interested in. So now I'm going to go to the Kalman filter, okay, a classical method from 1963 by Kalman. It turns out that Gauss knew exactly how to do a Kalman filter in the uh, 1820s, but he didn't have a, a computer. As far as I can tell, Gauss knew everything that I know and <coughs> everything else also, but um, <laughs> what can you do? The Kalman filter goes back to our equations here, the one about the prediction model and the one about the observations, and it makes some simplifications. It assumes that the probability distribution of the state is just a multidimensional normal distribution or Gaussian. It assumes that the deterministic part of the forecast model is just linear. And it assumes that all this noise, the stochastic part, is itself Gaussian. For the forward operator, it assumes that the operator that maps from the state vector x to an observation is linear. And we've already made this assumption that the noise on the observations is Gaussian. So if you make these assumptions, basically if you start with a Gaussian state with linear operators and everything Gaussian, you will always stay with a Gaussian state. And that was the magic part that Gauss knew. Um, so this is the side part. It turns out that the product of two Gaussians is a Gaussian. And you could derive this uh, easily if you had the time by just writing down the product of the exponential definition of a Gaussian in high dimensions. Okay. So if you have two normals, okay, the first one has a mean mu1. And that mu1 is, again, the length of this state vector. So uh, 500 variables of temperature in the room. A covariance matrix sigma 1, which would be 500 by 500 in that case, or 100 million by 100 million in the case of a big weather model. 
and you're going to multiply that by another normal distribution with mu2 and sigma2, then it turns out that the statistics of that product are simply computed. The covariant is the inverse of the sum of the inverse covariances. And the mean is an inverse covariance weighted average of the two original means. And I'll show again in a minute graphically exactly what this means. Turns out that there's a weight term too, which we're going to ignore today. It doesn't come into the methods we're talking about. So back then to this equation for data assimilation, once I've made these assumptions for the common filter, the numerator is now a product of two Gaussians. I've assumed that the prior is Gaussian. I've assumed that the likelihood is Gaussian. So I'm just going to multiply together two high dimensional Gaussians. The denominator normalizes it. And I know how to do that from that previous slide on multiplying Gaussians. Graphically, it looks like this in two dimensions. So if you want to think about this dimension as the x position of the ball and this dimension of the y position of the ball, my prior now has a normal distribution. So my best estimate of the ball's location is here, but there's uncertainty around it. My observation has a Gaussian error distribution. So this circle of equal probability here is actually the circles that I showed you for the uncertainty of the observation before. Okay, so plotted as a probability distribution. The most likely value of the observation is where the red plus was, but there's uncertainty. It's possible that the observation is really indicating that the ball is out here or out here. So I have normal now times normal. That nice easy uh, exponential product says that the product of those things is normal. Remember I pointed out that the mean of the product is a weighted mean of these two and it's a little hard always to visualize this but this is actually lying on the line between the two means here. That's where this one is and it is closer to the green one which is slightly higher, had slightly more um, probability near its middle. And the height, width of the product, it's higher and narrower. So I have more certainty. I've gained information about where the ball is now. Now I know it has less variability in my estimate than the two original pieces of information. Does this make sense? Okay. Yeah. So, yes, good. Right, so you're asking as I, I sequence through this, is there a buildup of errors basically? No, or, what I meant, uh, um, as you reported with the single step, then the, the covariance of the step area and the step will be narrow. Okay, you're asking does it actually converge to, to something as you go yes. forward? So even with a new uh, product um, observation, it will not be uh, adapted. Um, that's actually a very good point. Um, in a system where I am not growing, um, during the forecast, if there's not a growth of uncertainty, you're correct that the blue would keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller each time and would eventually converge to a delta function. That type of behavior is normally bad behavior because we really aren't certain about things in the assumptions we've made and would be called filter divergence in that case. The blue becomes so certain that it ignores subsequent observations. And in fact, later on I will talk about methods to avoid that type of problem. But yes, your intuition is exactly right. Okay, so this is great. The problem is that I have to do all these computations on these covariance matrices to do the Kalman filter. And those are 100 million by 100 million matrices. I can't store them. I can't do the computations. Okay, so I'm out of luck there. So now I'm going to do something that actually looks crazy. And for about 10 years when we first started these methods, we were generally viewed as crazy. I'm going to have an ensemble of forecasts like I did for the ball. And I'm going to try to make that work with the Kalman filter context. So to do the common filter, I have to have a normal distribution. So I'm just going to take my 20 forecasts in this diagram here of the ball's position and I'm going to fit a Gaussian to it. So I'm just going to compute the mean and covariance of those positions. <coughs> my likelihood was already Gaussian and I know how to do this product. So, okay, if I make those assumptions, I get the blue. And now somehow I have to find a way to move these 20 ensemble members so that they now represent the posterior. And if I could do that, I might get these estimates here and then I could cycle the whole thing, make another forecast, do new observations. I still haven't saved myself computational expense. 
Okay, to actually work in a high dimensional space like this, I would have to have at least 100 million of these ensemble members have to do the computation. So it's actually gotten more expensive. Okay, so that looks pretty silly. So for a minute now, I'm going to talk about a one dimensional ensemble common filter. So now this is for temperature, and it felt pretty cold to me outside this morning. So uh, it's not really zero C out there, but it felt like it. So I have five ensemble members in this idealized case. These are somehow a forecast of what I think the temperature was going to be outside this morning made from a previous time. So I fit a normal distribution to them, so that's easy in one dimension here, mean and variance. I have an observation, some instrument that's sitting outside that tells me it's a little bit warmer than my forecast thought it was. There's the posterior. Now I have to do this procedure to somehow get an ensemble that samples that posterior. And it turns out the easy, naive way to do that is to simply take my prior ensemble, shift it wholesale so that it now has the same mean as the posterior blue distribution, and then linearly compact it around that new mean, squeeze it in so it now has the exact mean and variance of that blue continuous distribution. So this is a one-dimensional ensemble common filter. Okay, it turns out it's exactly an algorithm for solving the common filter in cases where the common filter is the applicable solution. Does this make sense? Really simple. Good. So now I've got this problem. I have 100 million variables in my model. Okay, so what happens if I have an observation outside here at um, Minnesota this morning, but maybe one of the next state variables in my model is really the temperature down at the airport? What I'm going to do now is show a method that allows me to efficiently compute the impact of this observation on any other variable <laughs> in the model state vector. And that is basically just going to be doing um, linear regression. And it turns out that the product of Gaussians in the Kalman filter is just a linear regression. Okay, so now this is a bivariate distribution in the middle panel. This is my observed variable of temperature outside here. This is the unobserved variable temperature at the airport. And these are my five ensemble members. So the forecasts I have in the green here suggest that there is a weak positive correlation. In general, if it's the forecast thinks it's warmer here, it thinks it's warmer at the airport. But it's not great. I'm going to compute by the method I just talked about, okay, for the one-dimensional problem of the observed temperature outside. I'm going to compute this updated thing, and I'm going to get these increments. So these are the ways my estimate changed in my ensemble. And I'm just going to naively then, okay, so I've squished this marginal increments back down to here. I'm going to naively linearly regress those. So there's a least squares line through the bivariate distribution of temperature here, temperature at the airport. And then the linear regression of the increments simply looks like this. I project the increments onto the slope of that line. So as an example, this one projects there onto the red line. I then project those over onto the unobserved variable. Okay. And these are what I'm going to call my increments for the unobserved variable. In the time we have today, I cannot analytically confirm for you that this is correct, but this is in fact doing exactly what the Kalman filter would do. And now I have suddenly not had to compute big, big matrices. I've only had to compute a bivariate matrix, and I've only had to compute statistics on a bivariate matrix. So that is two times the size of the massive model. It turns out that this particular feature is what makes the ensemble common filter a powerful tool and a viable method in very, very high dimensional systems. So an ensemble common filter data simulation facility then looks like this. This is the general algorithm that we use in our software. These are three ensemble members, and each asterisk represents this entire huge long state vector of whatever model you are. You need more than three to do it for real, but in the cartoon, that's fine. So at some previous time when I last had observations, I got these three estimates, and I use my forecast model to make an ensemble forecast to now when I have new observations. I then sequentially process the observation. So I take the first observation, I compute a scalar estimate of what that instrument would have seen. So for instance, that might just be interpolating temperatures to a particular point in the room. I then do this one dimensional solution that's nice and easy. So I have an observation there, I get increments in one dimension. And then I use the methodology I just talked about where I simply regress these increments onto the state variables 
and I can regress it independently onto each state variable. Okay, that keeps the computational cost small, and it's also a nice uh, parallel computational capability. I can do all of those regressions onto my 100 million state variables at once. Okay. And I keep repeating that until I'm through with all the observations at this particular time, and then I'm free to proceed with the algorithm forward. I make new forecasts to the next time with observations. So in the late 1990s, uh, we'd figured out these things in the ensemble data simulation field. That was great. And data simulation scientists like to work in low order models. This is a model that was developed by Ed Lorenz in 1995. It's called the Lorenz 96 model because of the date of one publication, sometimes called Lorenz 95. This is a chaotic system. Ed originally meant this to represent the evolution of weather along a latitude circle, like what weather does along 40 degrees north. But it's really a pretty idealized system. Okay, and so you can see that there are some sort of hints of a wave motion. There's a group velocity with these waves. Uh, but the thing that is nice about the system is if you make very, very small perturbations to the state at a particular point and integrate it forward, it has extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. Ed, called, uh, Ed Lorenz called it chaotic, and one could argue formally whether it is or not. But for data assimilation, the point is that if I take my single red solution to this set of equations, which I'm going to call the truth, and I make very, very small changes to it at one grid point and then start running forecasts from those. And let me go back up to the next one. So you can see that that blue starts to appear and then it grows. And eventually the blue things are indistinguishable statistically from the red. Okay, they just look like another random solution to this set of equations. So in data assimilation now, what we would like to do is take observations of the red the truth as we go through time in the same way that we did at the ball trajectory and then use those noisy observations to try and use an ensemble common filter to move our blue estimates. So our blue is what we really know. We never really know the red. Okay. And we're going to use these observations, noisy observations of the red to get a better estimate of the blue. So as you see going through here time, I'm taking 40 observations of random X locations of the red and you can see they don't lie on the red because there's quite a bit of noise that I'm simulating in those observations. So every few time steps I observe the red curve. Uh, those things are not exactly on the red curve. And then I'm using this ensemble common filter to do the blue. And this looks crummy. What I would really like, of course, is my blue, which is a series of analyses and forecasts. I want them to look like the red. Okay. Well, eh, they don't look much like the red here. Okay. And worse than that, they're very confident Okay, that they don't look like the red. In other words, if I were taking this, I'd say, oh, well, all 20, in this case, of these ensemble members say the truth is down here. That must be where it is. Well, it's not even remotely close to there. So this is a complete failure. And this was the state of the field in the late 1990s. We were at an impasse on how to make these things work in moderate-sized chaotic models. So it turns out that one has to then go back and look at the assumptions that were made in developing this general theory and try to figure out the places where we are ignoring important things. And it turns out that the first order important thing was back when we were doing this regression, I was using those bivariate statistics and I was slapping that least squares line on. It turns out that that's pretty noisy. It turns out that there are sampling errors because of the small ensemble sizes I'm using. And those sampling errors actually get worse the smaller the correlations are. It's easy to get a good estimate of a correlation of one. Everybody says that they're the same value. It's very hard to get an accurate estimate of a correlation of 0 0.1 because you just get this noisy mess in a small ensemble. And so somehow we had to find a way to use the good correlations that had high values and get rid of the correlations that had small ucky values. Uh, again, for the purposes of time, I will not be able to motivate in its entirety what the solution was. But the basic idea is this. For a particular observation location, like the observation that's being taken here, in this particular model, we know from the dynamics that that value of the, the truth there is strongly correlated with the value nearby, so close to it along this longitude circle. But it may not be that highly correlated over here. In the same way that you might think that the weather in Minneapolis this morning is correlated with what's going on in Madison, but not so much with what's going on at Moscow. And what we're going to do then is introduce some additional statistical tools that try to estimate those correlations outside of the raw common filter theory 
and apply that. And it's called localization in the field. We're only going to let observations here impact nearby state variables. And you can see the difference now. This is the plot I showed you before where the ensemble estimate is far away from the truth. And now things are significantly better. The blue estimates are lying much closer to the red truth. And the uncertainty in the blues very often encompasses the red. There are statistical tests we could talk about. But in general, with a 20-member ensemble like this, we would like the red curve at any particular point to lie inside the blue curves with a probability of um, 90%. Okay, so this is working better. It's not perfect yet, okay? There's still statistical artifacts here, but it's working a lot better. And so by the time we got to 2001, people were starting to make ensemble common filters work in moderate-sized systems by using this notion of localization. Although, people did not understand why it worked until about 2006 or 2007. It was originally put in as a computational savings trick. And magically, when you put that in, limiting how far observations worked, suddenly you could move to much larger systems. Okay, for students, this is a thing about research, is a lot of times you get these side benefits of trying one particular line of experimentation, which can later lead to new insight. Okay. Now, the other problem is, so far, I've been doing this with this simple Lorenz 96 model, and I've been using that same model to do the blue curves and the red curve. But in fact, the truth of life is that every model you have is bad, and most models are terrible in some sense. So you do all this work to build a prediction model, and there's all kinds of stuff that's not right in it. And so these idealized cases with a perfect model are really not very realistic. And so in this particular case, again, I won't go into the details, I'm going to mess up the model I use for the blue curves. The equation for the Lorenz 96 thing is up there for each one of its uh, variables along this latitude circle. And there has an external forcing, so it's a force dissipative system, so there's this F there. I'm just going to change the F in that equation, and it changes the dynamics of the system. So now I'm going to go back, and this experiment is identical to the ones we've done before. It has localization, but now the model, the blue model, is not quite right compared to the true red model. And initially things kind of look okay, but you can see as it starts to evolve, you get more and more instances like this. The blue has qualitatively got some resemblance to the red many places, but there's also places where it's clearly radically diverging from the truth. And this is really what things look like in most real geophysical applications. The models aren't very good. And even with good localization, if you start doing things, you get things like this. And in general, what may happen is that because you are too confident in your posterior, the filter may just totally diverge. The blue lines go off on their own merry way and are not related to the red at all. So the final piece then is that what's actually happening there is I am trusting my model too much. And so if this is one particular variable, again, this is, say, temperature outside. And my model says, here's a forecast, and I think the temperature values are sort of in this range. Because there is unknown model error, if it were known model error, I'd probably just fix it, right? So there's unknown model error with some statistical distribution. A very naive thing to do is to just say, well, I don't really believe the model that much. And so I'm just going to add some uncertainty. I'm just going to take my forecast and say, well, really, yeah, it might be that it's a little bit colder than the model thinks, or it's a little bit warmer than the model thinks. Okay, this has been called inflation, and literally, although naive, it's extremely powerful. We just take that high dimensional prior distribution, and we just move it out a bit around its mean. Again, there are statistical techniques to automate this process, but that's the bottom line. And so in this final example here, we are combining model error, localization, and one of these algorithms that estimates inflation. This middle panel is the one where this inflation is taking place, and this bottom one is the panel that we saw in the previous animation slide. Estimating this inflation takes time. We are trying to get more information from the observations than just the raw thing. But you will see as this evolves, this is an estimate of the inflation. This is how much we think the model needs to have its uncertainty increased as a function of latitude here. And you will see as this evolves that the inflation will start to correct for many of these problems that we saw without it. Okay. Again, it is not perfect. There are many other assumptions that we're violating here. But the bottom line is that in modern ensemble filters, these are ones after around 2007, 
it is possible to work in many, many very high dimensional systems across many applications by combining the basic ensemble common filter theory with localization to deal with sampling error and correlations and inflation to deal with model error and other problems that lead to prior estimates, to forecast estimates that are too confident. Okay. So as I mentioned, um, quickly now, I, I know I'm running um, close to time here. First of all, conclusions about the methodology I've told you here. First of all, it's trivial to write a basic ensemble Kalman filter. Okay, so an undergraduate can do it in an afternoon. Um, adding in this inflation and localization could take a good graduate student a week or two. There is nothing magical about these algorithms. Um, automated algorithms exist to do that. Again, they are codable by good students. And so you can get a good working filter. On the other hand, for large model applications, you have to do efficient parallel processing on this. And that is non-trivial to implement. Okay. I'll come back to that in a minute. A point I haven't made strong enough here is in any estimation problem, but particularly in these ones where you're making all these assumptions, it is essential to calibrate and validate your model. If you just apply the method, slap it into a model and observations, you will get answers that are um, not good. There are a variety of additional enhancements to these algorithms out there that are used in applications. I won't talk about today, but there are additional ways to make these better. Now, what my team at NCAR does is we produce the data assimilation research test better DART. DART is software that provides all these ensemble common filter methods and well-engineered ways to interface them to new models or new observations. And the reason that you need DART for research instead of having your graduate student do yourself is that if you're going to get good performance on these large applications, the parallel efficiency across various different types of platforms is a lot of work. It's a lot of software engineering and it's not publishable, okay? And so in many cases, if you're interested in applying methods like these, we encourage you to at least try um, our software. There's some other packages similar to it so that you don't have to do some of that development work. So DART is free, it's well tested, it works with many, many models both across geosciences but also in various other fields, epidemiology, uh, social sciences, people have used it for various election prediction and other things. It can be used to do data simulation research, so I use it for my personal research. As I mentioned, it is professionally software engineers, so one of the things I can do at NCAR that's hard to do at a university is I have people who are paid full time to just engineer the software and do user support. Okay, it's used by a lot of these university users. Um, I've worked personally with about five dozen uh, graduate student thesis projects in the past years, but there are also people who do it independently of us. Uh, and another one of the big advantages that might be of interest to people in this room is that it is very easy to add it into your model or to add in new observations. It does not have a footprint in the model. Okay, so you can take your existing model. You don't have to make code changes to it. Okay. Um, enough of the basic idea. You can do big complicated stuff. So numerical weather prediction is sort of the top-notch application for data assimilation because there are international groups that have a hundred people building prediction systems like this. So DART can be used to make competitive numerical weather prediction. This is just an example of one system that was run at NCAR for a few years. Uh, this is with the WARF model, which some people in the room use. There are five other university groups in the United States that do real-time operational numerical weather prediction with DART and either WARF or the new MPAS model. Quickly, I know I'm over time, but I'm just going to give you an idea. This works with all kinds of Earth system models. Uh, this is a space weather model, so upper atmosphere. Um, more relevant here is um, this is ocean atmosphere, so coupled ocean atmosphere data simulation. One can do coupled lake data simulation. There are atmospheric chemistry, so chemical weather air pollution applications. Uh, this is an application showing the impact of new observations. So it's not only for validating models and using them, but also for other things. And I still have a question to come back to for you, I just remembered. Um, Land modeling. So I know there's quite a bit of land modeling of, of interest to some people here. There's lots of land modeling. And this is just an example. These are all graduate students or postdocs who've worked with a particular land model with DART to give you an idea that this is doable to get publications and theses out. Um, these are, again, novel remote sensing instruments, some of which you've worked with. This is ice work, which I know some people have been thinking about here. So this was work done by 
students and postdocs at the University of Washington on ice. Um, so lots of applications are possible. New applications are possible for students. Um, we have lots of documentation. Everything is available publicly. And that's interesting. I've lost my C in the end on this version. Um, this gives you pointers to our website. That should be a dart there. This gives you a pointer to a sort of entry-level publication from a decade ago that still introduces the basic ideas. Quickly, the first question I'm going to answer was the one about detecting model errors. And so basically that adaptive inflation algorithm is one example. The model ensemble forecasts are compared repeatedly to the observations. One can detect, for instance, that on average the model is too cold at predicting a temperature at a particular place. And one has statistical distributions to work with on those things. So a prior estimate of the PDF, the observation estimate. One can build statistics on top of those types of inputs to try and estimate model error. The caveat is that estimating model error like that doesn't tell you how to fix model error in, in general. There have been instances of using data simulation that have pointed to a particular line of code. In general, it's not a panacea. It tells you you have a problem here, but then there's still a lot of work in figuring out, okay, so how do I fix that problem? Thank you very much for your attention. So since we are running out of time, so a few questions, one or two. Anyone? I get you. No worries. Thank you. Thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, I at some point may have lost uh, what happens to the linearity of the of the model uh, of the deterministic model. So is it still in the approximation or you take the nonlinearity and become some noise? Yes, so the linear approximation was only made to justify the common filter theory. But in the applications that we're doing here, we have relaxed those constraints. So we're still applying the method motivated by the common filter, but the model can be arbitrary. And in fact, that Lorenz model is a highly nonlinear model, which led to the error growth, and all these big models are. So the theory is out the door. The method still works, and you, of course, have to add in these additional statistical corrections to the method because you've lost that linear Gaussian stuff. Does that make sense? So that the nonlinearity becomes, is, is, in the mo is in the determination a base method that we use in the model or is it transformed into some kind of uh, uh, force? The model does, the models here do whatever they want. So if the models are nonlinear, that nonlinear evolution is showing up in the priors. <laughs> and the forward operators can also be nonlinear here. So that's also coming in. And we just, at this point, forge ahead in the same way that you will take any linear or weakly nonlinear theory and then say, what the heck, I'm going to violate that and, and see how it works. That's the philosophy underlying the approach. Hi, I was wondering, do you do anything with information theory to quantify the uncertainty of your model errors or your observation? So I personally have done very little. We've had a number of collaborators who have done this through the years. Um, the one who did the most work related to this was Tapio Schneider, who's now at Caltech, um, that was motivated by this. There are definitely people doing ensemble common filters with these and other tools who consider an information theoretic view of what's happening here. I can give you some more specific pointers if you want um, afterwards. Is there a way to know uh, the ensemble common filter can deal with the problem with a million dimensions without actually yeah, so you want, you want to know is, well, I have some big model and it's going to be some work to implement an ensemble common filter. Do I know ahead of time if it's going to work? And I would say the answer is, um, the honest answer is no, <laughs> you cannot. So the, the dishonest answer would be there have been many, many, many large models where ensemble common filters have been implemented and they work. And so if your model looks like one of those other large models, I think you can have much more confidence than just, I don't know, I'll, I'll try it. And so talking to an expert, someone like me who's done, as I said, our team has done over 60 large model implementations. And so we can provide you some guidance to help you know that. But there's no guarantee at the end of the day. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. <laughs>
Do I have free time if there are any students that actually want to ask more questions? Okay, I'm just not quite sure how the schedule evolves. So I will hang around here for a little while if there's any students with more questions or more detailed stuff. I have actually studied on how much I'm a teacher, but you already 